Praise the Lord, everybody. Thanks for coming on this Wednesday night. I know that uh, the flu symptoms are ravaging our community. I have several employees that are out with it at, uh, currently, and I uh, appreciate you coming. The, um, I will make my comments brief tonight, and uh, as it is Wednesday night, the middle of the week, and I know all of you work very hard, I, uh, I will keep my, uh, my comments brief. And, and, uh, but I'll tell you, even though that I know we're tired and I know that, uh, again, it's the middle of the week, I've got a really bad buzzing down here for some reason in this monitor. But um, I feel like that God has given me something to tell somebody. And who that is, I'm not really sure. Uh, those of you in the youth, do y'all have a youth activity tonight? You can be dismissed. Test, test, test. There we go. I can deal with it if they can. I'll just pretend it's raining. Um, the I've kind of grown accustomed to that sound over the last few days. Um, but I, I do feel like... Brother that Tim, I, excuse me, Jim. Would you mind... Turn that sound system off, turn it back on, see if it'll go away. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? All right. I'll let Tim do his magic up there. Test, test, test. Okay, that it, there it went. We up? Great. Thank you. I do feel like um, tonight that I've got a message for somebody, and it may not be for everybody. And I've, I've really never taught a lesson quite like this. It's a little bit different than than my norm. And uh, but you know, whenever I was preparing this uh, this message, I was I was like, you know, this this is not a message just for everybody. This is for somebody specific. And I, I just had that kind of laid on my heart that this is for somebody. And if that's you, good. And, and, and if it's not you, then maybe you can get some edification out of it or, or know that it is for someone around you. Um, if you would, turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 46. Praise the Lord. And I forgot to mention we got a, at least one first time visitor. Is it Charla? Glad Charla's here tonight. And everybody give her a big hand. Thank you. Don't you love technology? It make your life so much easier. Um, okay, where were we? Psalms. And I, and I have to admit to you, and this is, this is something you'll probably think very poorly of me about. Uh, but... You know, I think we all have our favorite books in the Bible, and Psalms ain't mine. It's just, you know, it's my least favorite. I can't help it. It's just kind of go, you know, it meanders and goes on and on, and I'm like, yes, yes, you know. But in Psalms, you can really pick out some, if you, if you can get through the songs, you can really gain some wisdom out of the Psalms. And it's not my favorite read, I'll have to admit, but... This is a very, very important thing that the psalmist was saying right here in chapter 46. Um, 46 and verse 7 says, The Lord of hosts is with us. 
The Lord God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, that desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow. He cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The Lord God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. What a wonderful thing it is to know. And in our daily lives, it's very difficult sometimes to understand and really uh, uh, on, in your daily life, in your work life, or in your marriage, or, or what, you know, just your day-to-day life, it's very difficult sometimes to remember among all the turmoil and all of the just things that happen in our lives, it's very difficult to always realize that the Lord God of Jacob is with us. And But if we can truly understand that and truly understand that even when we're having a bad day, the Lord God of Jacob is with me. That's a a very powerful thing for us as Christians. And, And, hey, on Wednesday night, that's who's here. We Christians. This, this is the night of edification. This is not, this is not the night of, 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 uh, you know, yes, we want everyone to come. This is the night that the Christians get together and learn the scripture and, and, the, and be edified and grow and feed. And so, um, but in this scripture, it tells us to be still and know that I am God. Um, my dad, which my dad takes a lot of abuse from this pulpit, as my brother is the pastor, and uh, he's not here tonight. He's sick, but tonight will be no exception. Um, I remember whenever I was young, I, uh, I was afraid of the dark. And uh, my mom worked nights sometimes, and sometimes my dad worked nights, and they would sort of switch off who was doing the night shift and who was doing the day shift. And, and so uh, sometimes, because I was afraid of the dark, and, if, if, and you know what? I still am, and uh, so are you. If you don't believe that, uh, try going oh, 40 miles out in the Ozarks with no flashlight and no fire. I learned I'm afraid of the dark. Go by yourself. It's a real neat adventure, okay? And uh, you'll learn that, hmm, you know, I am afraid of the dark. Uh, I, you might not be, but I still am. But that's off the off the subject. But... I would sometimes sleep with my dad, and I just so happened to be the world's worst insomniac, and I still am. I'm talking terrible. You know, I I think in Proverbs it says that if you you can't sleep, you have a guilty conscience. Well, I was born with a guilty conscience because I just never have been able to sleep. And uh, my dad just so happens to be the lightest sleeper in the world. And so I would say, Dad, you know, can I sleep with you? And he said, yes, and of course, he had to get up at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning to go to work. And so I would, I would get in bed with him, and as an insomniac, you're just sitting there looking at the ceiling. You just never go to sleep. And uh, I would just, I know my dad was a real light sleeper, so I just, every now and then you got to move, you know, and like get bed sores if you don't move. So I'd move, be still. And I'd say, so I'd take a deep breath. Be still. So, it, you know, if, when I was sleeping with Dad, I was like needed a straight jacket. I'd just like be totally still. And then I, that really kept me awake, you know, trying to be perfectly still. So neither one of us got any sleep, to make a long story short. But Dad would say, be still. <laughs> in, in the story of Saul, I'd like, like to relate all of this to the story of Saul, and uh, King Saul, the first king of Israel. And uh, we talked about, uh, I know the pastor talked about him a few weeks ago, and I have taught about him recently in my class. 
but it really is just happenstance that he entered into the lesson tonight. But in the story of Saul, the thing that really caused the downfall of Saul, of King Saul, is that, you know, whenever he was first brought before the people and he was first named as king, first anointed king, he was so humble and he was intimidated by the position, no doubt. And even though, and he was, he was handsome and he was tall and he was strong and all of those great things that we like to look upon and, but he was, the best thing about Saul is he was humble. He was humbled by the idea of being king. Well, over time, it came to where being king, being a star, being the best looking, being the tallest got to him. And he became proud. He was no longer humble. You know, you can't be humble and proud at the same time. <laughs> Those things don't work together, you know. It's oil and water. You can't mix humble and proud, you know. I often like to say there's so many great things about me, but the best thing about me is my humility, you know. It just doesn't work that way. Um, but the, uh, he had lost his humility. And, but the, and once you lose your humility, you start wanting to do things your way. And you start wanting to do things in your time. And one day, he was needing to offer a sacrifice because the children of Israel badly needed to go to war. Okay, They were being surrounded on all sides, and before they ever went to war, there needed to be an offering made to God. There needed to be a sin offering made to God because you, as a Jew, you couldn't walk into battle. That's just like whenever I'm in an airplane that's doing this. I'm like, oh, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Make atonement for me. Um, I do. I repent every time I get on an airplane. I die daily and several times a day when I'm on an airplane. Um, I'm afraid of the dark and airplanes, so there you go. Um, but Saul was in a bind. And because he knew he needed to go to war and he had gathered up his army, he had gathered up his men of war. And the sacrifice was laying there, but there was no prophet. There was no priest. And Samuel was a prophet and a priest. There was no priest to make sacrifice. And here's Saul going, come on, where's Samuel? Come on, old man. Don't you see that we're about to get overran here? This has got to be done, and it's got to be done now. Come on. Where is that old prophet? Well, all right, I've had it. I'm just going to do it myself. We don't have time for this. I'm just as good as Samuel. Hand me that knife. Whew. And he made sacrifice. And, you know, there's only two examples of kings and priests in the Scripture. And they were both theophanies. And one of them was named Jesus. <laughs> who was a king and a priest, and he didn't just make sacrifice. He became the sacrifice. Um, but Saul was not a theophany. He was a man, just like me. And he said, I will be king, and I will fill the role of priest because I don't have time to wait on the man of God. I don't have time to wait on you, God. I will do this in my time. And in my own way. And that was a great sin before God. That was the beginning of his downfall. And God sent unto him an evil spirit that vexed his soul for the rest of his life. And he lost his kingdom and he lost his sons. He lost everything and even his own life. And they chopped his head off and nailed it to the temple nailed it to a pagan in a pagan temple because he did things 
in his own time. He did things his way. He was not willing to be patient and wait. Um, and you know what? I'm, we can all look at Saul and feel bad for him or despise him for the things that he did to David or, or despise him for his ways, but you know what? I'm just like him. I'm just like him. I, you know, I want things. I, I, I think that whenever I go to the altar, it should be like Burger King. My way right away. You know, I should be able to just say, God, this is what I want, and this is when I want it. Now, here you go. It doesn't work that way. It never works that way. There is a way that seems right into a man. But that is the path to destruction. And there is a time that seems right for us. Yet it is not in God's time. And we have to wait. And we have to understand whoever this is that I'm talking to. And it may be more than one. I don't know. Maybe it's me. I don't know. But there's something. I don't know, and there's something that you're contemplating. I don't know. Are you contemplating divorce? Suicide? Adultery? What are you contemplating? What is it? What is that that you want so much? What is that that... You don't have time to wait on. Is it, I don't know, is it your job? Are, are you out of work and, and you're desperately looking and nothing seems to be there? Are your finances, are you broke and nothing seems to be working out for you? And you want to blame God or you want to, I don't know, I don't know. There's somebody Maybe several somebodies, but there's, you know, I, I've, in the line of work that I've in, I've talked to many, many people that have attempted suicide. And um, I've had some friends commit suicide. And, uh, but I've talked to many people that have attempted it and genuinely attempted it the next day. And that was a part of my role at one of the facilities that I've worked at in is to talk to this person and make sure that they are stabilized. And uh, most people, not all, most people that have tried to commit suicide will tell you the next day, that, I don't know, I would never do that again. That it just seemed right at the moment. It just seemed like the only thing that I could do at the moment. There just didn't seem to be any other way but my way. But now, I can see. Now, I, I don't know what I was thinking. I have heard that very same story verbatim hundreds of times. That, I, I, no, I'm not suicidal. I, I, you know, that's just not me. I, 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 but it seemed right at the time. And uh, if you're there, or whatever it is that is got you by the throat, know that the God of Jacob is with you. And he is an on-time God. Does not seem like it. Doesn't seem like it. It seems like, you know, we sing that song and it seems like, man, that is exactly wrong. He is not. He is not on time because I've got a watch right here and he hadn't done it for me yet. I haven't received my miracle yet. But I'll tell you, I've lived 
and not too long, but long enough to tell you that God has never, ever, ever lived up to my expectation on time. But I, when I look, around, look back at my life and I see that my, my steps were ordered of God and they were perfect time. <laughs> it was timed perfectly. Things happened systematically in my favor. And I thought all the time, what is the holdup? <laughs> what are you waiting for? But it was his time. If those things had happened in my time, if I had said, well, I'm going to take the bulls by the horn, I'm going to do things my way all the time, my life would be a disaster. I can't run my life. I learned a few years ago that I'm going to take this, my hands off the wheel. That I'm not, God's not my co-pilot. He's the pilot. I'm just along for the ride. Okay. I have, that's what, you know, and I know that faith plays a great key in understanding what I'm saying today. And I think a few years ago, I went beyond faith. I went beyond belief in God. And you say, well, you don't believe in God? No. Because I once believed in the Easter Bunny. Well, no, I didn't. Never believed in the Easter Bunny. I did once believe in Santa Claus, but he wasn't real. I, I, I maybe believed in a few things that I did believe in the tooth fairy, and I don't think the tooth fairy's real. Went to the dentist today, and he didn't think so. Um, but I had beliefs in those things, and they weren't real. I do not have a belief in God anymore. I have a knowledge of him. To me, he is as real as this desk, maybe even more so. It's not a belief that I have. I know him just like I know you. So it doesn't really take faith for me anymore. He has worked some things in my life to where I don't have to have faith anymore. I know. It, but there are some of you out there that don't know. And this is where whenever you can't see God's plan in action, when you can't tell that things are going your way, Whenever you're just lost in the dark and you don't have a direction, it's when you need to be still. You need to be still. You need to listen for that still, small voice. And you need to turn off the TV and the computer and the Xbox and the Bluetooth and the whatever. And the Facebook and the blah, 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 blah. All the things that distract us away from that still, small voice. It says, be still. Be still. And know that the God of Jacob has a plan for you. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew. And we will uh, read starting in chapter 6. Chapter 6, and we will start at uh, verse 25. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than the meat, than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? 
that, you know, that's humorous to me. He was kind of being smart alecky there. It's like, how many of you can get taller just by thinking about it? How many of you can solve problems by worrying about it? You can't. Um, he, he was kind of being comical there. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, which today is and Tomorrow is cast in the oven. Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? And the uh, something we really need to get into our head is that we are the apple of his eye. And if you have especially now all of humanity he came and he died for all of humanity but if you have entered into a blood covenant through baptism in his name you've taken on his name you're his child you are the apple of his eye and he knows when a sparrow falls the Bible said he knows how many hairs are on your head. He doesn't have to think too hard on some folks. But we won't go there, Marty. You are his beloved, the apple of his eye. It is you. And... We just need to sometimes be still and behold his majesty and behold the plan that he has made for you. I think I said this the last time that I spoke, but I did hear a, a minister not too long ago that said, what God's got for you is for you. And he's got a plan for you. Now, it just depends on whether you're going to take your hands off the wheel. If you're going to be still. Instead of being in turmoil and just having madness going on in your life, worrying yourself to death. And trying to hurry up the process. He said, just be still. Whenever the disciples, and I'm almost done, so stick with me, please. But when the disciples were in the ship, and the, and the ship was tossed, and there was a raging storm, and they were sore afraid, and Jesus was asleep in the hull of the ship, and finally, you know, they, I'm sure no, nobody had a fingernail left. You know? And uh, they were worried sick. They were really stressed out. And they said, well, hey, why don't you go wake God up? <laughs> hey, that's a good idea. Let's go wake God up. God manifested in the flesh sleeping in the ship. Let's go wake him up. And so Jesus, oh, what is it, fellas? Uh, this uh, God manifested in flesh thing is, is uh, it gets me pretty tired, so I'm sleepy. So wh wh what's the problem? He said, well, come up here. We'll show you. Come on. Hurry. We're about to sink. And he said, okay, I'm, okay, I'm coming. I'm coming. He comes up to the, to the deck of the ship, and uh, they say, save us. Jesus, we're about to be swept away. We're surely goners. This is going to get us for sure. This, we've never seen a storm like this. We're going down. 
for real. <laughs> and Jesus just said, peace, be still. And it all just calmed down. And it all just went away. And what seemed to be so bad and so dangerous and so life-threatening and so harmful just went away like it was never there. And it's because they decided to wake God up. And you know, God loved those disciples. They were boneheads. Wow, you know. They were fighting over who was going to be first, this and that, you know, uh, worrying over money. You're walking around with God. So are you. (laughs) You're walking around with God. Why don't we just wake God up? Why don't we just, you know, the next time that that Marty's up here playing and and, and the singers are singing something beautiful and, and you feel good, God move on your heart or the minister has has preached something that really struck a note with you, why don't you just go into the bowels of the ship and wake God up and say, hey God, I need you. We need you. Come on out here. We got to have you today. Got to have you. And he'll say, peace be still." say don't worry I don't know how many times in the scripture I've never counted it but there were several times in the scripture that Jesus said fear not don't worry be still just listen I don't know who this is for really don't it's the weirdest weirdest message I've ever taught but there is somebody I'm convinced of it that needed it. Maybe it's me. I need to wake God up. And I need to let him know that I'll be still. I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to let you work your will and your time. I'm not going to rush things. I'll be patient, God. And I have faith. And I know that you are there. I know that you're in the bow of the ship. The storm is raging all about me, but I know that you're All I have to do is wake you up. And you will put peace and stillness as soon as I'm still. As soon as I'm still, you will make the storms subside, abate. And, uh, you know, probably, and I say that I don't know who this was to, looking... Looking back at it, I think probably maybe it was to all of us. Because there's, you know, I, I, there's never been many times in my life to where, and I think my brother says it very well, that, you know, either you're, you're in the storm, coming out of the storm, or heading into one. And that's just kind of how life is, you know. And uh, maybe it is for all of us. Maybe we just all need to be still. Listen. Listen for that still, small voice. And get that peace that passeth understanding. Thank you. Appreciate you. Let's stand together. My, oh my, what a beautiful lesson from the Word of God tonight. And uh, I certainly... Appreciated it, needed it. Praise God. We're all going to go through a storm sometime in our lives. And uh, I'm glad. I'm glad that he's just as close as the mention of his name. How many times have you ever called on his name and he was right there when you needed him? Right in just in time. I'm a lot like you, Brother Jim. He never was on time for me, on my time, but he was always right on time. 
but he knew what I needed exactly when I needed it and how I needed it. Isn't it amazing how God works in that way? How he works everything out just perfectly in his time? And you go, oh God, you're just showing off. <laughs> you think you know everything, don't you, God? I guess he does. He's a great God. You know what I'm thankful for? It's for you. I'm thankful for this church and uh, what it means to me. And uh, you're a great church. Thank you for being here tonight on a Wednesday night. And uh, hopefully we'll have a great turnout on Sunday morning. Looking for a great move of God and worship service on Sunday morning as well. Charlotte, it's so good to have you here tonight for the first time. And hope you'll come back and be with us and join with us again. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise one more time. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Would you bow your heads with me right now? Father, we do love you tonight, and we're so thankful for your hand of love and protection and your goodness and your mercy. Lord, we ask you right now to apply this word to our lives and to our hearts and minds that we may draw closer to you, Lord, and and use it and stand on it and trust in it, Lord, we pray. Thank you for Brother Jim Whitley tonight and the Word of God. And bless his life, Lord, and his family. We give you all the praise and the thanks for it. And everybody said, in Jesus' name.